Hello, I'm Rob Hirschfeld, CEO and co-founder of RackN, and the March 18th Cloud 2030 discussion started about open source, transitioned quickly into Kubernetes, but really got into the business drivers behind building infrastructures and talking about the future of what they would look like. Uh, great conversation throughout, and we get to some really interesting places. Uh, enjoy it. I saw something yesterday that I haven't been keeping up. K3S. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Kubernetes Lite. I use that, yeah. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> that's what it is. I was wondering. That's the first time I saw mention of it. There's at least There's two, a... maybe three um, different Kubernetes Lights uh, that are popular right now, right? There's three. Yeah. I've been tracking. Um, because the AWS um, distro that they they released is a light is a is functionally a light distro also it's it's opinionated it's not exactly light it's the difference yeah there's k3s which was rancher and now susa and it's been quieter since um since they came out we i used it i i, I have some some automation on it that's actually pretty slick um for the Raspberry Pi lab that I do. And then I, I test it on the clouds. It's, it's very usable. Um, and then there's micro Kates, I think they call it. Yeah. Micro Kates. Yeah. Um, and that one's, um, Marantis is behind that, but somebody there is not just Marantis. Like Marantis is promoting it, which is their MO, but they're, um, I, I think it's actually by a different a different group originally. Yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar. I could easily go do a, a lazy web search, but I don't know off the top of my head. Um, and then uh, the Amazon, I was surprised because I saw the Amazon thing come through and that distro is is being presented as a micro Kate's alternative. And that doesn't include like Minikube, which is the developer version that runs all all in one all in one on a desktop. Yeah. There's like eight of them now. Wow. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, just, it's, just, it's just Google single net Kubernetes cluster. So are, are we saying it's not bad enough that you can't share between um, standard Kubernetes, uh, the uh, um, different distros, and uh, that now you can't share between Kubernetes and Kubernetes Lite or Kubernetes Lite to Kubernetes Lite? <clears throat> I, I actually think the distros are relatively compatible, right? Because there's there's a API test that makes them work pretty pretty much the same way. Um, but, but I've heard I've heard that from a from a get up to speed for developers, um, and I've only heard this anecdotally from a few people, but that there's a pretty steep curve. Like if you're using you're familiar with OpenShift and you decide to go use. Um, hmm. Uh, somebody else's that's a pretty steep learning curve to get up to speed oh like the differences yeah um i think openshift is that's more true for openshift than other products okay. so maybe it's specific to uh openshift versus alternatives um, yeah i mean with micro kns it, other than you know starting and stopping the cluster um I mean, there's really functionally no difference. Yeah. Can Kate, I can't speak to micro Kate's, but K3S is basically the Kubernetes code base, but they made some, they hardwired in a couple of pieces. So it's, it's not really a fork, but it's sort of a build decision. There's a couple of things that they, they are, are, Leaved in, but yeah, it's basically the same code. John, for micro Kates, it's the same thing, right? That's yeah. basically Kubernetes just packaged for smaller footprint, right? Yeah, it was basically done for developer desktops, right? So you don't want to farm an entire cluster to get these things done. And then, you know, Minikube, which was the original one, um, was by far the most painful to install. Um, <laughs> and it was not a full, it was not a full Kubernetes implementation. So there's a whole bunch of things you could not do in Minikube, so with micro KNS or K3S, right? It's pretty much a full on cluster. Yeah. You're just running a control plane on the same node. And you, well, and my, uh, K3S eliminated etcd, 
which I think was a good call. So they, they uh, switched the back end. So you didn't have to worry about that part of the, the bring up. And then they put all the tools into one binary. So you don't have to install six binaries, the server and the, um, the controller and the uh, client, even, even the kubectl are all in the same binary. So that, yeah, that made it micro KNS. But I, I would say, yeah, the, the micro KNS, I think the challenge of micro KNS is when you start loading it up, you put Prometheus on, you put all the other services on, you know, it, your desktop slows down. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, is, uh, you know, I've also heard that concern, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm trying to be fair here as, as someone who is, um, openly um, uh, and regularly um, uh, uh, not hateful, but not appreciative of Kubernetes in the enterprise. Um, I um, am, uh, you know, still, you know, sensitive to the fact that there are um, many areas uh, that I'm not that familiar with. And um, the folks that, um, that I've been talking to, uh, and it, again, it's a relatively limited group. I wish I had um, a regular wider audience of um, potential adopters in the enterprise, but most of the people that I know that are using Kubernetes on a regular basis are using it at scale or they're using it as an Amazon distribution um, on Amazon um, or you know Google. Um, but it just, it, it, it seems like, um, the one of the biggest concerns is the inability to manage anything um, inside Kubernetes without adding significant ad different additional um, tooling or solution sets like Splunk or Prometheus or something like that. And is and I guess the reason I'm asking whether that's fair or not is um, when of vSphere was two or three years old, um, how much monitoring did it have on VMs? I, I, frankly, I just don't remember. I remember we had a lot of gaps when we were first building VMs uh, based on VMware at Gilead. <laughs> we had a lot of gaps, like you put a VM in a machine and you couldn't even find the VM, you know, things like that. So it was, um, and, and the ability to balance memory and CPU utilization were hor horrific and, and determining how much, um, uh, a particular uh, 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 VM was using versus others, or whether or not you were efficiently utilizing the box as a whole, were real problem spaces in the first two years. Um, do we see right. Kubernetes ever doing any of that itself, or do we see that Kubernetes is always going to have to have three or four bolt-ons in order for it to be a comprehensive um, package for actually not just delivering and distributing applications, but also effectively managing the resources and the risks that are supporting those applications. Um, I, I'm happy to take a, a shot at answering the question and see where other people land. Um, the design that the community around Kubernetes has wanted is that Kubernetes is a is a kernel. Right. And so that is that drives exactly the what you're describing so that the, there will be by design uh, an, a growing body of add-on extensions, capabilities, and components um, sort of answering those questions rather than it coming out of, um, it'll come out of the CNCF perhaps, yeah. but it yeah. won't, it won't, it won't get added into Kubernetes as a, as a product. Which I, I actually think is one of one of my concerns about the the product, the, the Kubernetes systems, right? I mean, I guess if you this is where Red Hat OpenShift is not Kubernetes; it's an ecosystem uh, curated by Red Hat around you know that makes Kubernetes into a product. Right. Well, also, um, also why Red Hat is so vociferous in their refusal to support anything that isn't Red Hat top to bottom, um, if if you want their support. Right. This is what makes it very hard for a company like RackN to be a, in the Kubernetes space is that the people who are doing Kubernetes distros are 
typically lining up around those types of statements, right? And so they need they want to own the account top to bottom. Whether they can or not is a different question, but they that's that's it's it's, it's funny. Linux, right? Sorry? It's no different than Linux. I ex I'm, I think well, you're right. I'm interested in your expanding on the comment. Yeah, actually, me too, John. I mean, I, I, I have a couple of thoughts on Linux as well, um, uh, and I'd, I'd love to hear your, your, your take. Well, I, when you got Linux, you didn't get all the management utilities around it, right? You still have to deploy monitoring, you still have to put all the other pieces to it. And in the case of Linux, you know, Red Hat did the exact same thing. They became the person that wrapped the tools around it to provide a supported distribution around it. Right. So I, I think I look at Kubernetes and say, it, at least it comes with something unlike Linux. Right. It's a much more complete orchestration system than just a simple Linux server where you have to go add the orchestration to it. But yeah, I think that that's not where they're headed. They're, they are very much trying to be an orchestration platform, not a comprehensive solution. And they're happy to let CNCF try and drive out you know, the best of breed in the ecosystem. Hmm. That's what I'm, I think one of the things that we need to see happen on that is in the Kubernetes space, I'd actually love to go back to the Linux space and, and you know, we're talking open source effectively is you're getting distro vendors who are pulling together bits and pieces of, you know, open source projects right now. A lot of those projects are single companies, like a company that does one thing in it. Um, when what customers actually need is a spectrum of components to make all this stuff work. And so I think it's, it's, it works as an open source community, maybe to have somebody be like, I am the, you know, open security platform around Kubernetes and open source it and get a whole bunch of adoption, but it's ultimately a product that they're selling cross planes like this. We've talked about cross plane some, um, where there's a company, clearly behind Crossplane doing a lot of that work and putting in the open and hoping it gets pulled into Kubernetes. But that makes it hard then for other companies to embed that, that, pro, that, that component into their platform. This is, this is what I'm, I want to try and I'm trying to, con, to say this concisely. We're, we're in this balkanized world with open source projects where around Kubernetes, which is predominantly major vendor backed the there's a whole bunch of small people solving small problems as individual companies that become essential in the kubernetes build that then if you were going to build a workable stack of of kubernetes stuff you're mm -hmm. going to either be crossing a whole bunch of vendors to build your stack or you're going to have a vendor who has to then own stacks of things managed by other companies even though they're open source they're still really managed by other companies. And it, it strikes me as a very difficult thing for companies to navigate, uh, users to navigate and vendors to navigate. I'm sorry, Rob, when you say companies managed by other companies, are you talking about this, the vendor sources? I'm talking, yeah, the projects are, are vendored. Projects, okay. So the or, whatever the organization is that takes responsi editorial responsibility for, for this, small tool or the the component that's being integrated right okay there there have been a couple of places where i've i've seen like in the observability space you had two startups who managed to collaborate pretty well um around the spec and then that got adopted and it seems like the observability spec turned into a pretty good collaboration around this so i'm, I'm not to me it's it's not a not always a problem, but there's you, times when. Who are you referring to in in the observability space? Um, I I'm, I know Honeycomb. I'm trying to remember the other company. Um, uh, I should. Oh, well, um, Honeycomb. I, Honeycomb as an example, I think it's they've, good... they've they've done they've done you know they've done an amazing job on the on branding and marketing around observability, and... but but they pulled something back into Kubernetes that became an observability standard right. around. Kubernetes as at the monitoring level, and then they're providing a service on the and back end. Don't you don't you foresee someone doing much the same with Kubernetes based on some, you know, one of the long poles or maybe multiple 
long poles in the tent for the use of Kubernetes, basically doing a doing a good packaging job kind of the way Honeycomb did. But here's the here's my thing with with what Honeycomb does is I think they did it right. There, there is an API that will ship logs to a observability service. Right. So they open source the client, if you will, not the service in the back end. Um, yeah, it's well, and that's smart for a number of reasons, mostly because their customer base that really needs this has already made a choice regarding how they want to consume log information and and do the analytics on it. So trying to trying to come in with an opinion as to which of those you want to jump on, you know, basically restricted their their field of operation, let's put it that way. But I mean, to me, eventually and, and probably sooner rather than later, the observability question is just part of an application you know, performance monitoring pro sure. you know, component. Right. And and so the idea that I have um, that, you know, I'm going to piece together my platform out of all these different vendors doesn't strike me as the, as, as, as sustainable, especially it, for most people using, well, using. Yeah. I think you're right. You're absolutely right. And, you know, I, I keep thinking of it and I, I use the image of, you know, an end user being, you know, kind of committing to something with Kubernetes and, and being surrounded by a swarm of mosquitoes, or these kind of little, little pesky, you know, tools and, and, and bits of operation that they have to, they have to deal with in order to make use of it. And the, the integration or the the unification of it is up to the end user, and that's a bad that's a bad choice. So, oh, sorry, Rich, go ahead and finish. Yeah. So, I guess my question is, who's going to do something? Well, if, if we're looking at something other than observability, if you were looking at for someone who was going to do the the confluent of of Kubernetes. You know the way Confluent, you know, took on um, mm. Kafka. I think that would be the that would be the that would be the the thing that I'd be looking for from a commercialization point of view. And the question there is, does anybody have a leg up on that kind of an offer? Well, I think if, yeah, go back to the open source thing, right? So, um, yeah, so we've been working, I mean, so one of, one of the things we started with the notion of saying someone needs to carry that out and, and there needs to be some ability to customize it. And I can tell you that it's a pain in the butt. But when you start trying to put your, your um, mosquitoes and organize them and everything's moving underneath you, um, keeping a coherent tested stack is no trivial, no trivial uh, feat. Um, but when you do get there, you now face the question of saying, okay, well, can I actually open source this, right? And and the answer is, it's really not from an investable no. perspective anymore. They're not going to take Apache 2 anymore. You have to go into a restrictive license agreement. Exactly. And that's what we're kind of seeing, because we, we tried to carry the entire development staff through all the deployment and operations side. And I think we've done a decent job of, of doing that, but it's a, a significant engineering feat to keep that going. Um, you know, and our model was, you know, originally saying, let's just make a new lamp stack where everything's mm -hmm. curated out of a ecosystem yeah. that people can just adopt it and you get community to maintain it, um, which I think is the right thing to do. But I think from a, a fundability perspective that no one wants to see Apache do, I think Elastic kind of scared everyone off. <laughs> oh, scared the vendors off. Sure. Scared the, scared the, the, the people writing checks off. Right. Which I don't think it should have. I mean, they're they're still doing, you know, they're making eighty plus percent of their revenue on SaaS, right? They they still found a good way to make money. They're still a, a you know, billion plus valuation company into it. Um, but from a, a defensibility perspective, right kind of stuff. If you don't keep core of your technology protected somehow, 
Um, it's just yeah. not popular right now. I, right. I, I mean, this is, I think this trend was happening, it's been happening with investors slowly for a while. I mean, it, they could, if they're SaaS, they have no reason to actually release their code. Right, I mean, that they don't, they don't have to. They could just stop making commits to the Apache project and maintain an internal fork. What's what's their advantage to actually continuing to publish their SaaS code publicly? And maybe well, I, think, they, I suspect uh, they don't do all of the like their operational components. I don't know if they publish them or not, but why bother? Uh, well, for me, and I can't talk for anyone else, but why bother okay. is. To, to, to build a team when, when you're done putting, so think of just all the orchestration pieces you need to put together to create a coherent managed system, right? So we talk VMware, we're, we're talking a pretty sizable engineering team to, to oh, maintain yeah. what is mostly a proprietary system, right? Don't even have to deal with other people making changes to it, right? And so the advantage of open source is when you get a community you can actually start supporting things, you, you can leverage the community, right? Without having to build up an entire engineering team wrap around it. Um, you know, I, I would say that was, you know, the thought process for me, at least around it, but stupid reality. Yeah, I mean, do, do you, I mean, this is, we, we uh, just giving our, our history, if you don't know it, right, we had started our, our work as open, so open source, basically at the core, and we found that where people wanted to contribute were the pieces that we had proprietary and the places where they never touched were the places we had open and we flipped our license um, from that perspective. But the consequence is you can't use our product without a license. It's, it's a licensed product, no matter how much of the code is open at this point. Um, and I, it didn't, doesn't impact, I mean, it impacts the people who want to come by and not pay for it and pay for the product and, oh, and pay that, for the IP, but it doesn't, it doesn't. It limit wasn't, it to isn't that users. kind of the point? Aren't you in exactly the point that you want to be where you, you've got a situation where you, you are a commercial, you know, you are not a philanthropic organization, Rob. And so, you know, there is a, this is a, this is a commercial, this is a commercial offer and what the va what is the value that the customer gets for you know paying paying for the license I, the the thing the challenge that we see is that there are the, the the value prop in open source is supposed to be this community effort and and from our perspective people cuz and we saw this happening there were people who were using our software for thousands of running production data centers in the thousands mm -hmm. of units. Um, and because we couldn't write software that was fragile and required consulting, um, it, there, was no, there was no monetization drive for those people. And they didn't want to participate and help either. Maybe we should just get over that and, so and provide as a public good. But that, wasn't, that, 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 what, that didn't work. It didn't work in the places we've seen in, in industry across the board, right? I don't yeah, know. I was going to say, where, but, where have you seen it work? So what Rob's model is, is the old Unix model, where, it, where you provide mm -hmm. the, the core aspects of it, and then there's a community that puts in the stuff that they want to contribute, like what Rob was saying. So you've got the user groups and everything else along those lines, and it's, again, the Unix model as opposed to the Linux model. Got Rob thinking. <laughs> I well, it's in in some ways the Linux. Yeah, there there are you know so many distros of Linux. I think there's two Linux models. Is the reason why part of what I'm thinking, Rocky? Because I think the Red Hat canonical SUSE Linux model is different than the BSD and you know every other you know, Alpine and, and all these other models where um, I, it, there's almost two Linuxes from that perspective. Is that, a, do you agree with that? Uh, yeah, there it's, it's the way, in lots of ways, it's the Linux foundation model as opposed to the open mm. source Linux model. <laughs> I 
I mean, I think Lenny could exist because no one's willing to pay AT and T licensing fees. And so now they're paying Red Hat licenses instead. <laughs> well, and that's so. I, I don't know if this is uh, uh, worthy of conversation or not. Uh, I would just throw it out there. But the the idea for open source uh, beyond what Rob already pointed out is um, effectively free consumption. Right. I mean, that's what it boils down to is that people assume they can download something and start using it like they did with <clears throat> with the base of Rob's platform and what some people try to do with Kubernetes and and what many people do with Linux. But is is open source a success if, in fact, the only time that uh, the quote unquote and I, I'm, I'm using the quotes very seriously here because I, I, I'm trying to deny the idea that they're actually open source, that the product is only really usable when it's configured and sold by, um, uh, by a vendor like Red Hat or Microsoft or Amazon or Google. Is it still open source? I mean, so what that, that, it's, that its base is open source? If the only way a uh, enterprise can effectively consume it is by consuming it through one of those vendors. Otherwise, the overhead and difficulties are too high to surmount. Then does the term open source even apply? Well, why don't we take a different example? Excellent question. Why don't we take Nginx? Hmm, okay. Right? That, that's an open source product that's had massive wide adoption without licensing. Right, it, it is massively used, and and you go to the and, and they're they're contrived, you know, pay for our our paid version to get these additional features. The additional features you get are pretty thin, right? But it is a valid open source model, and that what they're really driving in that is not licensing for the product. They're they're charging for support for the product. Right, right. So you've got three open source models. You 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 charge for support. And I'd argue Nginx has done a very good job of doing that. Um, you, you operate it as a SaaS, so they don't have to use it. And then you charge for consumption fees into it. Um, and there's a third, it's escaping my mind right now. Um, well, well, Derek, Derek, Derek Collison and Synadia, you know, it's an it's a exact same model. Obviously, it doesn't have the same kind of widespread adoption in the market yet, and it's much newer. But it's the same idea. The product is super easy to use for... 80 to 90 percent of the usage care, um, oh, models oh, that the would need. Synadia's benefit on top of that is support and complex implementations. Yeah, and the third one I think it was Open Core was the third model. Uh, yeah, Open Open Core would be the product works, but you're going to need to, you know, buy something critical to use it in production. It would be, but I'll go back to think, think about um, Hadoop is another example, right? You know, it, it's extremely widely used and, and um, you know, there's a number of people that have, you know, put it into SaaS services and charge for support components to it. But you, you can't argue open source wasn't effective. You would not have the amount of, of um, data processing you have today had Hadoop been a licensed product. Right. If I had to go write a check for hundred thousand dollars, you, you would not have widespread data analytics. I'm thinking about that because Hadoop uh, Hadoop is interesting because you definitely had two vendors, right, who were duking it out early, and to make Hadoop work, you actually had to write pretty big checks just to get the infrastructure in place. It wasn't. Um, right, Hadoop, Hadoop wasn't just uh, install some software in the cloud and, and get data out. You had to make an investment. So, right. but that's one of the one, that's the older model of, that's Richard Stallman's model of free software in that you pay the consulting fees to get the work done, but the product is open to who, the, the work product is open to anyone and everyone. So large companies with money pay for the work and everyone benefits once that work is out there. And that model worked for a lot of the you know, Apache and, and whatnot 
uh, Cygnus, the company, actually was very successful for quite some time as they built uh, compilers and operating systems and stuff for Telco, where Telco paid them to do it, and then it became open, and then all the Telcos got to use it. And I think at some point the Telcos probably decided who was going to pay up this round. <laughs> well, but there, I mean, I, along those lines, you're, there, I'm thinking of like React and Golang, and you know, there's there's some very successful open source. Yeah, who paid that, for that Golang? Did exactly like what you described. Came out of you know, yep. Go came out of Google. Uh, React came out of Facebook. Um, MySQL and, came out of Sun. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Hadoop came out of hey, was it Yahoo? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I think so. so yep. That's exactly right. It's yeah. So that that's a very traditional model that we're not seeing as much of, and Red Hat is kind of the anti-pattern for that, especially now that IBM owns them. I have a curiosity to why do you say that? I mean, I think they're kind of a poster child for the charge support business. I model. say I say that because they're they're actually grabbing uh, other people's ideas and then locking everyone into their model of the idea of watching them in OpenStack. It was kind of uh, yeah, well. OpenStack, it was an interesting thing where they didn't have a strategy and then their strategy was let everything mature to a certain point and then buy up all the talent that created the mature product. And now that IBM has that, it's, it's the, uh, like Rob was saying, the opinionated, uh, if it's not in the Red Hat stack, we won't play. Yeah, I mean, that, that John and I know that all too painfully through our work with Ericsson. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many meetings Ericsson had with, um, with Chris, uh, the CTO at uh, Red Hat at the time, and they kept asking the same thing. Um, okay, we'd like to do you know, this part with Red Hat, but we want to be able to put our stack in the middle. And Red Hat kept saying no, and they kept going back and doing it over and over. And every single time they got the same rejection and they, they must have done that five times. And then they finally asked me to do it. And I didn't get any better results. Um, you know, they, they just flat out said no, um, which is why I actually suggested Ericsson should buy Red Hat. Um, uh, that was six months before IBM did it. Uh, I, I think we would have been better off if Ericsson had bought Red Hat. Maybe, yeah. maybe. I don't know. But it just, it seemed logical at the time as a way to, to pick a platform that was extremely common among operators anyway, at some level, whether it was at just the Linux level or whether it was OpenShift or OpenStack um, or whatever. So there was almost every operator was using something from Red Hat. Um, and then on top of that, Red Hat had the access to the enterprise that uh, Ericsson had been longing for. So I just seemed to make sense to me. Yep. And that's exactly IBM's play. It is, but I question whether it's a good long-term play. Yeah, it, it, it's hard to say. And at 33, I, I suggested the price would have been 32 billion. Uh, IBM paid 34 billion, but nonetheless, that's a, <laughs> that's a, that's a giant bet. Um, but you know, it's, it's the kind of bet that a company like Ericsson has to make if, um, I think, if they ever want to break out of the, the typical model of supporting you know, 18 month to 36 month product projects with the operators. And they, um, you know, they allowed AT&T to pull them around like a, like they had a nose ring in uh, for years. Uh, <laughs> attempting to build, yeah, attempting to build AT&T's magical cloud on OpenStack. And then they just threw out a bunch of code and, and scripts to the public and called it um, Airship or whatever they did and, and yep. said, look, look, we're all done. All you have to do is make it work. <laughs> and, then they, and then they just dumped it all and went to Microsoft. Uh, you know, I mean, it's like, it's just, they, I told them to dump the whole thing. I said, just ignore AT&T. But, you know, it's easy yeah. for me to say, I'm not, I'm not the CEO trying to figure out how to replace, um, you know, 10% of our revenue if AT&T decided to bail on us. 
<laughs> well, you know, I look at it like I, I look at that and kind of go, if you look at what's happening in the telco world and you think about, you know, what comes after 5G and how much of this is already virtualized out and how much this is going to be, uh, you know, the core value and the core business is going to get eroded, right? I, I look at it as a more fundamental question. Who am I going to be in 20 years, right? Because the business where I've made money today is not going to be where I'm going to make money tomorrow. Yep. So it's not a question of if I'm going to make a change. It's a question of I have to make a change. Or, or you know, Diomedes had the example of the frog in the boiling water. Just turn it up slowly. Well, that's that's what a lot of these companies are looking at, you know. So yep. they have to do something. I don't think they. I, I'm not going to comment anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave it at that. But you know, that I think is at the core of the, the Red Hat model. And my question is what Red Hat is playing to is all the enterprise companies that are moved slow, right? They, they want stability and they want a very safe path on which they're going to tread, right? right? I, I don't think that's a winning business strategy anymore. Well, I also think back to the, back to whoever said anti-pattern first, it's, um, uh, you know, you if you're going um, 160 miles an hour around the oval, and the oval is made up of a bunch of companies that play in the open source world, um, the first corner that's going to throw you off the track and crash your car into the crowd is the one that says Red Hat on it, because they are no more an open source provider than than I am a, a free gold distributor. Yep. <laughs> Well, and uh, so one of back to open source Red Hat, et cetera, the Linux found it. Well, it's not a foundation anymore. The, the Linux mega marketing company, <laughs> uh, hmm. you know, just, just watching it, uh, <laughs> literally, it's like, oh, you want to you want to put open source on your company, especially if you're a small company, give us money and we'll put your little logo up with the rest in the right little box of CNCF or open networking or this or that or the other. And now there's so many different boxes up there that it's, it's absolute noise because they're all tiny little companies with a couple of giants. So who are you going to pick? The logo that you can sort of make out that's one that's familiar to you because everything's in micro print. Yep. So it's it's no longer it's not useful to have a thousand different companies all doing virtually the same thing and open sourcing it and saying, oh, we're open, everything's free. Well, no, everything's just noise or garbage until something comes out that actually plays more uh, and is is expand, ex, expandable and extensible to larger problems. Yeah. It's all noise at this point. There's so. no signal. I'm, I'm thinking I'm through something. what that means, because otherwise yeah. you're you're we're building giant monoliths or giant tech stacks that are really hard to build. Um, well, the the key the the thing is is Linux has gotten to the point where they're saying we're not playing favorites, so right we'll just accept money for from everybody and no favorites and let let the market decide, but it's gotten to the point where there's too much noise for anybody to decide until Red Hat buys them <laughs> or, uh, or Google. Mm -hmm. Or one of the, yeah, well, it's, or uh, we've got, we've created a market where it's the, the, you're building, you, you, you don't care if you're giving away your software and IP because your, your goal is not to sell the software. It's to be acquired by one of the the larger companies that are verticalizing the software and have a monetization strategy. Yes, yes. So, Rob, yeah, do some future history here. Okay. Um, if you know, given the conversation we just had, what would be a a believable scenario around Kubernetes?
like what what should what would happen going forward in the future yeah yeah literally yeah. we've got lots of tiny little companies doing kubernetes and google exactly. kind of pulling the, yeah. the strings so like, here, I'll, I'll i'll give you i'll give you my scenario um okay well be, before you do that rob rich okay. can you provide maybe a little context to that as to well, I don't know what you're thinking, why, why that? Because that, I mean, I, I'm having a hard time following along. Okay. Well, uh, during the first, the, the early part of the, the conversation, Tim, um, we were discussing the fact that there were so many you know, small companies putting them together and organizing them as an end user was a problem that uh, curation seem to be one of the few ways in which a, uh, a commercial, the commercialization of Kubernetes could, could proceed. And that um, now, given what we've just discussed about um, Linux, how um, Rob discussed the approach that uh, a company like Honeycomb has, um, adopted for observability, let's, I, what I was asking Rob to do is point to the future and say, all right, maybe name a name, but at least run out a scenario for the, com for the successful commercial delivery and therefore the adoption of Kubernetes by a larger group of consuming organizations. Is that tight enough, Tim? Is that a, does that give you the context, or do I need yeah. to drill down further? No, go go ahead. I I probably should have just let you let Rob go ahead. <laughs> no, I, you know, having I'm, joined late, I'm I'm probably missing missing more to yeah. it. Why don't let me just catch up? Go ahead, Rob, and and let me catch up on it. I, it's. I, I think your question is reasonable, um, and it helps. It helps me understand what Rich is. What Rich was asking. So, the the when I think about the future of Kubernetes, um, my I, I look at software generations and what it takes to get a platform right. And to me, Kubernetes is not the final generation of this platform. And so what, what I think is happening at the moment and is reinforced by what I see is that we're actually looking at a platform with some core functionality and then a whole bunch of gaps and other components that actually should have, should be baked into the, into the platform. Um, and including serverless, I actually, I think that the, de the distinction between serverless mm -hmm. platforms and container platforms is going to emerge to be artificial. I was hoping you were going to bring that up. Great. And and I so so what I believe is is happening is I think Kubernetes has a limited useful life. Sorry, Kubernetes community, um, in which the emergent patterns that we are getting to now with Kubernetes are going to bake into something that, you know, that probably fractures into two or three emergent patterns. Mm -hmm. That if you segment that group into a thing, it becomes a much more contained thing. Right. Um, and then that becomes a new product, um, what I would consider a fourth generation, and I'll give you the generations, um, a fourth generation platform based on where, what we learned from Kubernetes. And so I, I actually think it's a mistake to think Kubernetes, I think Kubernetes will be around for a long time, but I, I, I think it's, it's, it is not a final generation and there'll be another thing. Um, and that is reinforced to me. If you look at like Mesosphere, which like was huge and then poof, was gone, um, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, there's, there is nothing, you know, nothing that says we aren't going to pivot quickly from Kubernetes in part because the, the fundamental things that we're doing to build Kubernetes are not Kubernetes. They're containerizing applications. They're building microservices. They're CIC pipelines or observability. And, and for the purpose of, of usability and, and kind of, Adoption in production. I think you're absolutely yeah. right. You, you called it a fourth 
generation platform. I'm not sure what you meant by that. So when I look when I look at like starting from PaaS to people talking about platform as a service, you know, four year ten years ago now. Yeah. Um, right. I think we had a generation like with Cloud Foundry and very platform as a service things. Mm -hmm. I think. I think we had um, like the Docker swarms and, and sort of the first generation container management pieces that Kubernetes sort of came in on top of and displaced. And so, and, and we have serverless stuff happening in, in parallel. And we also had like the Mesosphere that I was referring to mm -hmm. going on. I, I feel like there's, there's enough uncertainty with that and there's enough use case drift that we're gonna, there's another thing that's gonna come out of this. that's probably but gonna be simpler. Well, and I, I argue that we don't have any choice. If um, mm -hmm. if enterprises are are actually going to own a significant portion of infrastructure uh, into the foreseeable future, if digital transformation um, is an indicator of that possibility and and the coming looming importance, greater importance of of the bottom line and top line value of of operating and owning infrastructure effectively, if, if any of those things are truths in the future, then the ability for enterprises to uh, more effectively deploy and manage applications is, is a no brainer. I don't think the, that we can get there with Kubernetes because I think we've already been trying to make Kubernetes perfect for five years. And in order for it to be really perfect, it's gonna be even more complex and it's gonna have more tools to support it or somebody's going to try to build those capabilities into Kubernetes, which will even make it harder and more difficult to manage. Um, and I, I just think that we're, even in Kubernetes, I think we're still building for um, an evolution of, of app deployment and infrastructure management rather than a, a revolution in how applications are deployed and managed. Well, actually- and, uh, Go ahead, Rich. Uh, well, I think both what Rob said and what Mark just pointed out kind of leads me to think about the what does the next turn of the crank look like? And you mentioned serverless. You made a you made a I think you made a really good point about that. Um, you know, if what we what gets delivered by the industry by someone in the industry turns out to be a much more declarative, here's what I want, make, please make this happen. Don't, don't, don't make me deal with all of the, the, the fun, <laughs> uh, where we've got a dog fight going on here. Oh. Uh, uh, don't make, okay. don't, don't, don't put on me, don't put on my operations organization the necessity of being, you know, such experts in all of the, the, the fine points of Kubernetes and this, you know, enormous tool chest of, of specialized tools. Um, I think that's, you know, that's arguably the place that the market is going to drive it. And someone's going to curate, to your point earlier, Rob, you know, the right selection of tools. They're gonna to make it, you know, work from a point of view of a customer or a consumer where they basically say, I declare this to be what I need. Tell me, or actually just go off and do it. Manage the orchestration on my behalf based on my, on my, on my results. Well, I think. I literally was talking to the Azure CTO for APAC yesterday. Take Kubernetes out of the equation. They, they don't have enough talent right now to run the existing stacks. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. So, so there's a, a separate issue we keep getting up on. But let me throw a different path at it. Okay. Right. We can talk about Red Hat or VMware and that stuff. I, I think it's more likely, if you want to talk about 2030, that you're talking about Azure, you're talking about AWS, those become the curated stacks. I'm not sure Red Hat exists in 10 years. Well, I'm sorry, what, was the last, what was the last comment, John? Yeah, I don't believe. That's what true. I think 
we're, we're thinking kind of historically here. You, you, you look to Red Hat, they're rolling everything up. IBM rolled everything up. VMware is rolling everything up. But 10 years from now, who, who's really doing the aggregation and driving this stuff and what's oh, the model? I think, I, think, I think you're right. It's going to be the, yes. it's going to be the CFP. And right. I'd like to also point out, we should be looking for the Kubernetes uh, air, the, the next gen Kubernetes, because five years, Rob mentioned, we've been doing Kubernetes for five years. That's when OpenStack, Kubernetes came appeared on the OpenStack horizon at the five-year point. So <laughs> I, Kubernetes has Kubernetes has an adoption issue, right? They have yes. to get to enough penetration and issue. But I think once again, looking ten years down the road, right kind of stuff. I think we're also focusing on the long area, right? If, if we can't curate, so I don't care if you curate the stack or not, right? You you can't find the operations people to do this. So the important part about normalizing the stack is about being able to automate it, right? Automate the operations, automate the deployment. It's about applying AI and ML and all these various components to it so that you can automate the heck out of this stuff. And that's where the future is, right? That's where you're going to really find the value. It's not going to be in curating the stack. It's going to be in automating the operations of this. I buy I into that part. strongly agree with what you're saying. I, I actually... Uh, I'm, I love the way you said that, and I, I mean, so, it's, it's, it's personal for what we do with RackN, right? We are, we are literally doing composable automation to make the, the need for a vertical stack la less from that perspective. It's an, I, but I hadn't thought about it the way you described it, which I really like. If, if you can build an automated stack, then maybe you don't care about a lot of this stuff. And, and actually, but, I would say that might take away your whole argument about it having to be owned by Azure and um, you know, the, the MSPs. Right, so you have I to get the architecture right so that the stack is, is usable and generi generalizable. Uh, so I think we're getting all these experiments with all these things to learn where the hard parts are and where mm. the, uh, what can be thrown out. And so we need to be able to well, it's turning into the, the general cloud with uh, switches to customize as opposed to having 10,000 stars. So let's come up with a few models that work and then have switches to make things. We need to simplify it. I actually- um... uh, Through software, of course, which would make it more usable and less needless training. Go ahead, Mark. Oh, no, Rocky, I, I apologize. I didn't mean to try to cut you off. Um, I, um, Rob, if I could be so bold, and since we're running short on time, um, I would love, especially considering the title of, of, of this weekly event being Cloud uh, 2030, I would love uh, a, a couple of weeks worth of conversation on how we foresee AI and ML impacting how people utilize infrastructure and deploy applications, and maybe, maybe even um, a little bit about how AI may displace as many applications as they create new. <laughs> I would love to. We need to find some um, some credible experts. It would be would be helpful for that. Yeah. Um, not well, not maybe. not to put anybody here down, but I I would love to see somebody <laughs> who's really. No, I agree. Um, bring bring in some opinions on that. So yeah, let's let we can put out I, a, I think uh, a. Sorry, there's also a precursor to that, Mark, which is yeah. you have to generate the data along the operational spectrum and the development spectrum to actually be able to apply it. Absolutely. So no. we do what we're talking about, right? So yeah. um, I can explain some of the stuff I've been working on in that area, but you know that was the first part of it. Instrument it so you can actually apply the tools. Yeah. No, I mean, and, and John, I, I don't. I'd love to hear more about it, uh, and I—I I don't know for sure if this is the direction you're going, but you know, I have to make the assumption that um, if in 2010 at Service Mesh we thought it was a good idea to have graphical policy management for multi-cloud, yeah, ten years before the market thought it was even a necessity, um, that it's not about whether it was the right or wrong thing to do, but it was the wrong way to pursue the eventual right thing. And, and so I, and what I mean by that is that 
um, in the future, or, or actually, let me back up one more time. How often have we implemented um, solutions in an enterprise, as an example, that are individually uh, policy driven based on the user updating their policy? And how often does that get maintained and, and how often is it successful? Almost never in my experience. Documentum is a great example uh, in enterprises. Um, it's almost sure. never successful. Yeah. So if we're making an assumption that the only way we can manage distributed infrastructure and distributed deployment of applications and failover and multi-tenancy on everything from 5G to data sets to IoT devices, et cetera, et cetera. We can't assume that there's gonna be somebody out there every time a new app gets deployed, actually writing policy into how that app utilizes infrastructure. AI has to be effectively knowing your organization and knowing your demands and allowing you to deploy applications um, as if you're just adding another drop of water in the bucket um, and it gets distributed and, and uh, deployed and operated at the performance levels required with the compliance levels required. I mean, it just, it just uh, I, I realize I'm making it sound overly simplistic, but I just, we can't, we can't continue to, to, to build a bigger and more complex infrastructure and assume that um, that we can manage the intricacies of how applications are deployed by YAML files or policy written. <laughs> I mean, this is this is the problem. I know we're we're kind of out of time, but I think this is the root of the issue. Is we're not. We should probably spend more time talking about that very issue, which is. What are some of the challenges that people are having with this, that enterprises are having with it as an indicator of where, where they might go based on how they might solve those problems? And I think the other pieces, the other conversations around architecture and infrastructure and you know, whether it's serverless or whatnot come up uh, in that conversation, will naturally come up in that conversation. Or in some cases, I think some of them will fall by the wayside because we'll quickly realize that, you know what, it's kind of irrelevant in that five to 10 year time frame. Uh, and I'd like to reiterate on Mark the, um, the fact that we're looking at the policies and we need to extend the policy out to the operational policies right. where they have, if they're not integrated, we're going to keep on with this same problem of uh, com complexity and inability to actually get a handle on automation uh, without the integration of operational policy into the business policy and the user policy, it's, we're going to keep thrashing. And that's where Kubernetes is operational and we keep dealing with the operational mm -hmm. and stuff close to the hardware and we keep ignoring the compliance and the security and Sure. The uh, and, networking, uh, where it has to, where you have to have it available, mm -hmm. and stuff along those lines. Can I throw out a? And I know we're short on time, but we're out. Yeah. Just a an, an image, and that is, if I were to look over the next five years, maybe not ten, for the place, the alternate location, for this to all come together in a way that is customer or, or user centric i'd ask i'd ask you to consider a new generation of msp that is that is in the business of curation simplification packaging for a particular community of use and that may be an un at, at least at this point a less considered, but a very good source for the best solutions and the solutions that will hit some, will tap the right buttons for the, uh, for the oh, consumer, for the, Mark, for the, yeah. for the buyer. Rich, Rich, you're, can you're hitting my, my favorite. And let's kick this off for the next topic while we look for some AI speakers. Um, what you just described to me is, is an ecosystem. 
Exactly and, right. And I would, I would, I think we could talk an hour on what it would take to actually rebuild an ecosystem. I think, Thank you. I think it's worthwhile. Yep. All right. I think that's that'll be a topic for next think. week. I agree with it, but put, there's two things we covered before, Rob. I think one, I think yeah. we're in the weeds. I, I think we're missing the constructs. We need to think of the abstraction layers that allow us to actually function better. Mm -hmm. So we don't care whether it's Kubernetes or something else. I think right. as we kind of talked about in the previous call, I also think we're hung up on complexity. We're, we're trading organizational complexity for software complexity, and one has a lower cost. It's, it's inevitable, right? That's where the AI and ML comes into. We, right. This is this to me is is the Jevons complexity paradox question, where I I think that we need to consider that complexity doesn't have the same cost that it did, but you're you're I, I desperately want to talk about that more. Um, I like it. Yeah, I think it'll be a really good good topic. Let's they're, do it. Are, and they're interconnected. This is great. Thank you all. Wow. Uh, uh, these conversations are really powerful to me. Um, and the longer we talk, the more we open up really important considerations for the next years. There are major forces shaping the industry um, and creating opportunities for us. Uh, and we're starting to suss them out, I think, in, in really material ways. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Please join us at the2030.cloud and be part of the dialogue. Thanks.